In a slum area of North St. Louis, where 178,000 people live, the unemployment rate is four times the national average. The underemployment rate is a startling, sobering 38.9%. Well, my husband couldn't afford financial, a living for my kids and I. So I decided to change things by leaving and trying to do better here. Well, they say that the man is the head of a house. But here in this country, that's the opposite with the Negro Mill. The Negro Mill are the last hired and the first fired. Quite natural, they could, he couldn't afford clothing like they should have paid, and uh, food. So that makes a great difference. Mm. Because for the most part, the man is supposed to be the chief uh, breadwinner. He's supposed to be able to provide for his female. You know, mother always thinks about what a kid's going to grow to be. If they don't have these proper things, it puts different things on their minds coming up, you know. You never know. And a, a social aspect of, you know, theaters, and we can go to the restaurants, and, uh, and we can go to all of the uh, uh, parks and the museums now, where we, uh, here before we couldn't go. But the, uh, uh, on the job question, we're still just where we started. We haven't made any breakthrough at all. On the job question, we're still just where we started. We haven't made any breakthrough at all. This is a report on the Negro and the unfinished American Revolution. It involves his fight for dignity and a place in the mainstream of existence in St. Louis. White and Negro Americans live in different worlds, yet neither world can survive apart from the other. These two worlds can be truly united only with understanding within all elements of our society. This report will concern itself with Negro job opportunities. It will attempt to find out what's a man worth. majority of Negroes in America, the status has always been of an inferior nature. First, as slaves in the plantation system of the South. Next, as helpless sharecroppers. And now, 70% of all the Negroes in the United States are residents of black ghettos like this one in central St. Louis. As it relates specifically to this ghetto, in a survey conducted by the United States Labor Department, the so-called Wirtz Report, this fact, among others, was disclosed. As late as November 1966, 12.9% of the ghetto workforce were jobless, despite active efforts on their part to find jobs. 27% of those working full-time were earning less than $60 per week, the equivalent of the $3,000 poverty figure on an annual basis. Consider this in light of the fact that the city's population is now 37% Negro. A prediction by the Center of Research and Marketing forecasts a 46% Negro population here in just three years. So the impression of affluence and the hope for prosperity is somewhat reversed to the people living here. They live in poverty now when business and employment are all-time highs. The non-white is still the last to be hired and first to be fired. The white male who has had but a grade school education is making almost as much as a Negro who has graduated from college.
In the St. Louis metropolitan area, which includes St. Louis City, St. Louis, Jefferson, and St. Charles counties, 145,000 people work in professional, managerial, proprietary, or executive jobs. Only 6,300 are Negro. In occupations which require some formal education beyond high school, the chief employers of the Negro population are the various federal and civil service agencies. 241 are policemen or other law enforcement officers. 1,451 work in the Postal Service. And 2,600 are employed in other government agencies. However, in the clerical field, one in 20 is Negro. And in the sales field, only one out of 33 salesmen is a Negro. Out of the total labor force working in white collar jobs, less than four out of 100 workers are Negro in the metropolitan area. It is this small group that make up, in part, the so-called Negro middle class. Although the white residents sometimes think that these represent the total condition of the urban Negro, that things are getting much better, the shattering fact in 1967 is this. The median income for a non-white family is $3,622 a year compared with $6,613 for the white family. A white family makes 45% more. Now, we, we are in a bind here whereby you have to have a better, you have to make money in order to get an education. Education is expensive. Right. Culture is expensive. You have to have an education to, get, to, make, to make money. You have to have money to get, to, to get an education. Now, this is the bind that the Negroes trapped in. Right. This is Joe Grimes. He's 23 years old. He's married and is the father of three children. He's on his way to school. Joe will soon be a skilled welder. Today, he feels alive, needed, an emotion he's experienced only since he started school. What was it like before you got here? Oh, well, it was pretty rough, actually. When I got into my teens, it was, well, I'll just say rough, period. What do you mean? How did this happen? Well, I was delinquent, naturally. I ran the street quite a bit. I dropped out of high school, so I'd run the street. How, what grade? Oh, I dropped out of high school when I was in ninth grade, mm -hmm. very first part. And I uh, started wanting things that the fellas wanted. You wanted them because everybody else had them? Yeah, everybody on the corner had them, mm -hmm. you know. So that's what led me to steal it. Mm -hmm. Then I messed around. Went away for a while. Went away, that means you were in person. <laughs> yes, I was for about 15 months. Had you passed Joe on this street a year ago, he would have looked the same. It would have been impossible to tell that he was one of the 8,000 unemployed Negro men in the St. Louis area. One of the 26,000 men who are underemployed making less than $3,000 a year. Or one of the 17,500 who don't even try to get a job anymore. They are not even included in the labor market statistics. They have simply given up. Was your father in the home when you were a youngster? Oh, no. I had my father and my mother have been divorced since 55. Up after you were married? Well, I got married, I was unemployed, and then after I was married, I got a job. But it wasn't such a steady job. And I stayed on about two months, and then I went 
unemployment for a while and then another job. And then unemployment for a while and then another job. You know, and then just unemployment, period. And you just didn't know how to do anything. What kind of work did you do? Well, I poured the work down at the work. Mm -hmm. That was the only thing I could get. That was the only thing I knew how to do, push a bro. And uh, after a while, you know, that those just ran out. How, were, how was your life at home during this period? Oh, boy. <laughs> if you want to call it a life, it was rugged, real rugged for me and for my wife, for my kids, too. You know, we, no money, and we, we're not, we don't know everything we should know about marriage anyway. Yeah. So, constant arguments. I'm sullen all the time. She, uh, well, not that she wants companionship, but I'm, <laughs> I'm not affording this for her or my kids because... You know, first thing, I want a job, so. Did you ever leave home? Yeah, I left home. I left home after a while because, you know, wasn't, wasn't much since me staying there, drawing unemployment. You know, I left home, I went out trying to hustle, you know. I'd do little things, you know. Like, at first, I'd get me a little bank, so to speak. I'd wash one or wash somebody's car, so give me four or five dollars and maybe find a crap game somewhere, you know. Two craps. If I didn't make it that way, I just had to go wash somebody else's window or car the next day, you know. To the majority of Negro men in this area, the story is routine. Almost 50% of the Negro men working are in service jobs. <laughs> Jobs that pay little and lead nowhere. which supports approximately 30,000 men in our area is the building and construction trades. In order to work in this field, membership in a trade union is, in most cases, a prerequisite. Usually, a neophyte worker is considered a journeyman, a fully qualified tradesman, after he has learned his skill as an apprentice. Each union has its own apprenticeship program where men between the ages of 18 to 25 and sometimes 30 who are high school graduates and have a good police record learn their craft both on the job and in the classroom. However, many think there are far too few Negroes involved in these programs. I think there's... Uh racial discrimination in, in our unions in the city of St. Louis, of course, has taken on a new aspect. It isn't the predominant kind that we could put our hands on a few minutes ago, uh, a few years ago. Uh, it takes today the aspect that the unions are saying they want qualified men. And it's been one of the fallacies in our operation that we haven't properly trained these people to take these opportunities. We, we've opened the door to the, the job, but we haven't got qualified people to pass through these doors. Apprentices for the trades are selected by a committee of union and contractor representatives. The committee formulates and administers a test given to potential apprentices. Often the union, when considering the contractor with whom its members will work, reasons, the higher the entry qualifications, the more competent the incoming new worker. The high qualifications, though, when considering the Negro applicant who has not had the experience or background in the trades and who more likely than not has some sort of police record, militates against his meeting the high entry standards. I think the unions are using this as a, as a different type of segregation to say that uh, our men are not qualified. Now, I know you're going to ask me why. Uh, the white boy is able to get into this operation without this training. But you've got to remember that he has an ethnic background of training through 100 years of, of training through his uh, parents so that his opportunities are greater than the Negroes and we must be able to balance these scales and make this opportunity available to all the people of the city of St. Louis. 
Is it difficult for a Negro uh, youngster to get into the apprenticeship program? No. As a matter of fact, it's uh, very simple. Make application, and then the applicants, applications are processed uh, in the usual manner. Uh, it's not complicated at all, just being at the right place at the right time. If it's not difficult, Mr. Delphit, how many Negro apprentices are in the program? In 1964, there were seven registered Negro apprentices out of a total of 1,046 in the building trades. In 1965, we find 21 registered Negroes out of a total of 895. And in 1966, we find 36 Negroes registered in apprenticeship positions. We have an unconfirmed report that at the present time, in March 1967, that there are approximately 40 Negroes in apprenticeship positions in the city of St. Louis. A past history of discrimination in unions, plus a background not lending itself to work in this area, has produced a rather logical, but too often misunderstood effect upon the Negro. Uh, I found that in, from my experience, which has been rather extensive, uh, that we get predominantly so uh, with our Negro apprentices, uh, a high uh, degree of tardiness and uh, lack of, a, uh, of regular attendance. I found that many, if not most of the boys, come from homes that have no father in them. So that there's no example for them. Uh, they don't see a father out working all the time. So they don't accept it as the general rule that they have to go out and work also. And not only have to go out and work, but have to be there every day. Another reason, which I've not read about, but which has occurred to me that I think has some significance, is that maybe for the first time in these boys' lives, uh, they find themselves in a position where they're needed. Uh, that's hard for them to accept, uh, much less understand. This long-standing practice of discrimination as it relates to apprenticeship training opportunities has had a detrimental effect upon our Negro youngsters. They are not motivated, they're not inclined, nor in 1967 do they have any interest in the field of apprenticeship and training. The door has been closed. The door is still closed. If it is true that pigmentation is a mere balance of enzymes in the human body, it is also true that when that balance is tilted toward the black side of the scale, something happens to the human born black. From the very beginning, he experiences a peculiar sensation, a kind of tunus in an atmosphere of oneness. He is an American, but he is also a Negro, a different kind of human being. He has two sets of thoughts, lives in two different worlds, and is haunted with forever trying to solve the perplexing riddle that involves itself with this question. How can I, as a man, be both a Negro and an American without the constant threat of having the doors of opportunity slammed in my face? To better understand his feeling of complete despair, let's look at just one area in the so-called hardcore deprived Negro community. This neighborhood can be described as crumbling. There are 23,321 men, women, and children here, nearly 98% Negro. Of the more than 8,600 persons, 25 years old and older, two out of three have completed less than eight grades of education. Of the nearly 4,300 families living here, 70.3% have an annual income of less than $3,000. 
796 families earn less than a thousand. Trapped here in poverty by the lack of training, they have inherited their position through years of denial, the endless circle of frustration in the job mart. Well, if a man gets up in the morning and has nowhere to go, no, no work to do, no, no hope, no, no reason to plan and nothing to plan with, it seems to me inevitable that he'd lose his zest, his enthusiasm. Beyond that, if he is left out of things, and never has any responsibilities placed on him, which is the common case, then it's hard to imagine how he could somehow or other learn to behave in a responsible way. Some of them are without hot water, dingy, right, a lot of rats. I guess you've seen the alleys and whatnot where, they, where all this, all this uh, filth and garbage, trash, and rubbish is thrown out in the back. Well, it's, it's a jungle. They come out of the, these projects, come out and stand around. They don't, surely don't have the same uh, objectives in life that a lot of other people have. But uh, they care, they care about themselves. So when they get older, they start working in these day jobs and unskilled jobs. And this goes on for a long period of time. And and just passed on from one to the other. These are fishmongers here, you know. Most of them out here in these big trucks and whatnot. Now they're trying to, I think they were trying to ante up on something. A little bottle or something. A little bottle of wine. Now they'll do little menial jobs around, like they'll run an errand here or there and get a nickel of dime and ante up on a bottle of wine. They've had a big day. What it does to people, it's hard, it's hard, really hard to guess. Because the people who are apathetic are by the, that very fact not doing very much and not saying a great deal. How can we, driving by, figure out what, what the inner man must be like under those conditions. It's hard to guess, and I suppose the best we can do is guess. It must be a feeling of hopelessness, of irresponsibility, because there's no, no responsibility to, to take hold of. You hate to see the young ones get off to such a bad start because of these idols that they're worshiping have a far greater hold on than their parents do. It's a, it's a big thing when you see uh, one of your idols driving a Cadillac, two birds, got the hair processed, looking all dapper damn, sit around the processing all day and talk, brag about their exploits, try to impress the little young girls and things of that nature, pulling on them, saying smart cat in crowd remarks. And the little young kid who looks upon them in awe says, this is what I want to be because this is the closest thing to heaven I've seen so far. He wants to wear the black leather coat. He wants to wear the black jaguar hat. All these are great symbols. He's emulating the pearl who stands on the corner. Boy, the school doesn't necessarily prepare you for this type of life because you're not going to get out of where you are, so you might as well live best way you can, as fast as you can, as good as you can. Even if it does mean like hitting people in the head or burglarizing stealing. Try to give them a couple of girls on the block to work for them, hustle for them, live off of them. And on Friday and Saturdays, and when the weather is uh, nice and warm, it really jumps. The man that makes the most money, the yes. liquor store man, <laughs> he seems to drown their sorrows in a shallow cup. conditions change, another generation will be standing here looking on. Mm -hmm. 
Unless young Negro men acquire skills for jobs, the doors of opportunity will remain closed. The Negro must take advantage of the training being offered, and the business and unions must make it convenient and possible for him to take this advantage. Answers must be found to solve this problem. I think one of the answers is, is that obviously the testing programs ought to be reevaluated. Uh, recently in New York, the history had been that Negroes taking a particular test for an apprenticeship training program, the great majority of them failed. And uh, the unions, along with the employers, asked one of the universities to redesign the test. And the university did redesign the test, and the test was given again. The people who took the test, the great majority of whom were Negroes, the majority of people who passed the test were also Negroes. So that by the mere redesigning the test and making it appropriate for the type of job and for the background of the people who were applying, uh, made the difference as to whether or not they were eligible for this particular training program, or apprenticeship training. But I think that the important thing is that every year, for a long, long, long time, uh, while this pressure is necessary, that a regular number of Negro young men and older men are introduced into this industry so that everybody knows that it's happening, everybody gets used to the fact that it's happening, and more importantly, so that people get jobs every year. The problem of getting Negro youngsters into the apprenticeship program and subsequently into the trade unions can only be accomplished by a multifaceted plan of action. Good training programs must be established like the one at the Associated General Contractors Training School. On-the-job training is the most valuable way for the young Negro workman to overcome his scant knowledge in the building trades industry. However, there are those who are concerned about other present-day methods of introducing the unskilled laborer into the skilled workforce. Well, we must begin taking a brand new look at the whole concept of apprenticeship as a method of entry into skilled occupations. What do you mean by that exactly? Well, I think, uh, for example, the average apprenticeship uh, program suggests something like four or five years before you are prepared to become a journeyman, a, a fully skilled person. I think today, it, in many instances, you could train a carpenter, you could, you could train some electrical areas in less than two years. In the St. Louis area, more than 80,000 people work in manufacturing firms in jobs that are classified as primarily semi-skilled. In a survey taken by a member of the Teamsters Union in 1965, less than 10% of the total number of employees in 50 of the largest local firms were Negro. In many firms, it was 5% or less. Well, you know, one of the strange inconsistencies on this whole question of job opportunity is that many persons with limited educational backgrounds coming out of rural areas such as southeast Missouri, uh, Arkansas, and many other states find it easier to obtain employment in this area than many Negroes who are here who are living on the tax rolls, I mean who are living on relief. Uh, you know, we can pick up the paper any morning and find uh, jobs, uh, adver advertisements for people who want machine operators. Have you followed? You know, any of yes, I've followed uh, through with some of those, but uh, most of them, uh, they want uh, four-year men, you know, uh, many of the building in college for four years, or had on the job training for four years, or went to some trade school for uh, at least four years. And this I have not only been a machine operator now going on eight months. Although I know how to operate the machinery, I still don't have, you know, the equivalent they want, I guess. We know for most part that the majority of the jobs that, uh, that exist, it takes only a normal average intelligence. But when in a, <clears throat> whenever a Negro go in and apply for a job, the first thing he want to do is um, <clears throat> he want to tell you that you're not qualified. 
Now, what does that mean? You know, how much intelligence does one need in order to, uh, to install a telephone? You only have about four or five wires, and, uh, you know, if one does it long enough, you know, it's just like walking, just like a baby walk. I mean, how does a person walk? You only do it, uh, you only learn by practice. Now, uh, what we've got to do, both with whites and the Negroes, in this group of uh, people with whom we are working, is to bring their skill level, their talent level, or their knowledge of working in industry and business up to a point where an employer will find it profitable to lower his standards and his tolerances uh, regarding qualifications and bring them into the organization. The ratio of Negro to white men in skilled and semi-skilled positions in the St. Louis area has been described as deplorable. A combination of a lack of opportunity for skills training and loss of motivation on the part of the Negro has resulted in his mass unemployment. Demand for the traditional unskilled jobs is dwindling. Advancing technology dictates a further loss of employment for the old and young among this group, and the problem is acute. Particularly with the youth between the ages of 16 and 21, who are out of work and out of school, 50% of these are Negro kids. Uh, these kids uh, are idle in the neighborhood, they are impatient, they are angry, uh, and it is here that you find the, the volatile, explosive potential uh, that many cities face. And it is from these youngsters that the possibilities of riots may take place. Do you ever go to school? Yes, sir. When you go to school? Every week, every day. Every day. Well, how do you work then? Sir, I work only work on Saturday. Oh, just on a Saturday. Why aren't you in school today? Got suspended. Suspended. The wasted potential of the high school dropout has been described as a colossal loss of human resources. In ghetto schools, the dropout rate is as high as 28%. It is virtually impossible for these young people to get meaningful jobs that will lead to a promising future. Why aren't you in school today? I start tomorrow. I Why got in a little trouble. What kind of trouble? Burglary. In an effort to help save the many idle young men and women from a fruitless existence, the St. Louis Board of Education has established a special school which gives students who have unfortunate experiences in city high schools a second chance. Here, their past is forgotten and they have an opportunity to gain the necessary learning skills that can give them a brighter future. How many times have you been expelled from school before you came here? Uh, it was quite a number of times, you know. I just had a problem this time. What kind of problem did you have? Mostly it was, um, you know, respecting authority. I was always bucking the staff at every, just about every school I went to, you know. How many times have you been expelled from school? Twice. For what reason? For once I had a fight, and the second time it was an academic suspension. Mm -hmm. What would have happened to you had your expulsion from school been made permanent? What would you have done? Uh, I believe that I would probably be out, you know, standing on the corners fighting and Snatching pocketbooks and all this type of stuff, you know. Anything to make the big buck, as they call it. Mm -hmm. I've tried to get a job, mm -hmm. and if I didn't get the job, I probably was just stayed at home or roamed the streets. And... Motivating the so-called problem youngster is important. But what of the hundreds of students who are not problem youngsters? What is their motivation to graduate? Do they have job opportunities? Uh, opportunities are greater for the better students. Say for the bottom half of a class, there are not many opportunities. All right, you're all going to be graduating from high school this year, right? Yes. Pretty excited about this, I suppose, huh? Yes. 
All right. Uh, are you working? Are you working? No, no job yet. You have not seen the need for a job? Yes, I've seen the need. Just, I just don't have one. Just haven't had one. How about you? Yes, I'm, I guess I am working. What, what do you do? Well, I'm, uh, <clears throat> I'm an equipment maintenance man over at uh, AT&T Company's uh, plant over on Olive in Jefferson. Very good. And what's your ambition? I would like to become an electrical engineer. Right, so you're in, the, you're in the right groove then, right? Right. Some studies have been made about the ghetto schools, the uh, high schools, and uh, indicate that the average Negro child or child attending these ghetto schools receives two and a half years of education for four years of attendance. So obviously he's not prepared when he comes out of the high school to do anything. And the children are supposed to accomplish so much from day to day and from year to year. And uh, the tests indicate that after four years of attendance, they have accomplished about two and a half years of education. So that while they put in the time, they really haven't gotten the education. Today, uh, I think the Negro has the greatest opportunity that he ever had before in his uh, life. But uh, still, the big businesses are looking for the more intelligent Negro, the very intelligent Negro. And so uh, you have, you have uh, the average Negro left out. He's still left out. He's finished right yes, now sir. if he's average. Is that what yes. you he, He's not completely finished, but he's still left out the big picture where the good money is. It's particularly the bottom 25 percent because these students, sooner or later, will become un unemployed and unemployable as such. They are treated almost like those who fail to graduate as such, those who do not receive diplomas. Some may resort to some anti-social acts to uh, get some money, but uh, the question is, has society imposed this upon him? Uh, did he have any choice or any alternative as such? There's little doubt in my mind that they traveled this road because they had no alternative. No alternative because of limited economic opportunities. No alternative because of questionable family stability. No alternative because he feels like a nobody. His ambition is sapped. His ambition. The police record is a serious problem for men without education and training, another factor which makes him unemployable. One neighborhood counselor reports 59% of the people who come to him for jobs have some sort of record. Can you help a kid who's been in trouble, though? I mean, is it possible? Isn't he a bad risk on a job? I don't really feel that way. I feel that the high percentage of the kids that I meet are very good risk. They need, first of all, understanding. They need uh, liberal employment or employers. They need someone that cares about them because the employer doesn't understand the causes that uh, happen for a kid to have a police record, mm -hmm. which would cause them to find difficulty what are in these finding causes? employment. What are some of them? The environment, the social conditions, broken homes, all of these things uh, lead to juvenile delinquency and the kids having records. Mm -hmm. The employer says that he want a qualified Negro with no police record. The Negro got to be pure. They want, they're looking for pure Negro. Now the point is this. All Negroes, for the most part, have a police record. Or if not, they should. <laughs> and it's nothing, it's nothing to say that uh, uh, just because a Negro don't have a police record don't mean that he hadn't done anything uh, the only thing this point out is that that particular Negro, perhaps, he hadn't been caught. You can trace it as far back as your father. We can't get no jobs for Negro. If Daddy didn't get a decent job, what in the hell am I going to look up to? So what happened? This is for us, divided homes. That means that if you got to get something for your little girlfriend, going on dates and whatever else as a teenager, if you're going to get it, Daddy don't have it because for the most part, Daddy has been forced away from home. Daddy don't have a decent job, or if not, Daddy, for most part, is the pimp up on the corner, you know. Right, and if the employer doesn't take the risk, what happens to the youngster? Many, many cases, he will attack society again. To 
too often the poverty in which he lives leaves him no alternative. In too many cases, the prison term begins before the crime is committed. I'm hoping to get out of here, but it's due to the fact we tried to save money to, to find a place, but no one will let, one, you know, let us have it. We've even told them we had four kids, and they wouldn't accept those, unless it's a place like this. Well, you can see it, the wall is crumbling. And last Sunday, I don't know what happened upstairs, but I, I was laying here on the bed, and I heard something pouring. I went in the water, was just pouring all down. It flooded my bathroom. I flushed it myself every day with a bucket for three months. We get mice in the bed with the babies. I got up one morning, one was jumping around my ice box. Roaches around where the kids have to eat and everything, but they're in the bed with the babies. We have to keep pulling the bed from the wall every night. They're in the bed with us all night. Well, do you have any hope? I feel like really nothing now. I mean, I just, I don't have any ambition of doing anything. I mean, I'm, I'm uh... The needs are important and he often neglects his educational potential. A lack of education means a lack of skills. A skillless man is a jobless man. But even a jobless man needs money, so he schemes. While scheming, he often travels the road that leads to a police record. So it's his environment, his lack of education, and his police involvement that causes his employment problem. Yet, his employment problem causes his police involvement, his lack of education, and his ghetto life. cycle in which the majority of the Negroes find themselves, a cycle of frustration and hopelessness that pervades and distorts his life. Until the Negro can escape, he is moving in circles, and the society which is powering this merry-go-round is moving nowhere. The question seems to be, what are we going to do to get him off this merry-go-round? Well, fortunately in St. Louis, there is a network of crash programs underway designed to correct the imbalance of meaningful employment as it relates to the underemployed Negro male. Projects like the Work Experience Program operated by the Missouri Welfare Department, Work Opportunities Unlimited, the Urban League's Pre-Vocational Training Program and Youth Opportunities Unlimited, all working under the umbrella of the Human Development Corporation, will hopefully add skills and gainful employment to those who need it most. The chief instrument of training is the Diagnostic and Evaluation Center. the work potential of the individual is studied through testing and counseling to diagnose aptitudes and attitudes for work in various areas. Audio-visual tests. General intelligence test. Test for manual dexterity. And, well, you name it.
This is carried out in a one-week diagnostic service and an extended four-week evaluation. Now, we also operate here as our third component, the vestibule and workshop training area. And this operates in three sections. We train in specific skills. We also expose them to an actual work situation so that we can evaluate their performance under actual work conditions. Now, in addition, our third section is our group counseling, our pre-vocational, where we give them some idea of what would be expected of them in the work world, how to dress, how to fill out an application, uh, about Social Security, about unions, all the other things they'll need to know that will make them more employable. And out of this, we expect that those who stay with us will end up on jobs, and our experience over the last three years has been just that. If they stay, they do end up on a job. This diagnostic center evaluates and trains people who heretofore were termed unemployable. Now, most of them are sent here from the gateway centers. Incidentally, the Human Development Corporation operates 13 such centers. Their most valuable service revolves around the employment team. We have 13 teams of employment workers, employment counselors, a total of about 45 men and women scattered in all of the neighborhood stations. And since June, when the manpower program was begun, more than 12,000 men and women and older youth have applied for job help. They place an average of 75 to 100 men and women every week, and yet for every one they can place, there are at least three or four or five who are waiting, seeking a job. A counselor estimates that only about one out of every three of the men and women that he sees and his team sees are really ready to go to work in today's labor market. They need better education. They need some kinds of skill training. Yet, as the counselors offer these men and women skill training, Many of them seem to have to say, no, I can't take it. I need a job now. I need income now. And the training doesn't offer me enough money. I can't support a family on $35 a week that the training will provide. This is a choice they have to make, and yet it's a self-defeating choice because without the extra skills and without better reading ability, uh, the man will continue to be at the bottom of the barrel in the, in the labor market. As you've seen here, the females far outnumber the males, and of course everyone wants to know why. I guess if we knew the answer to that, we have solved a lot of our problems. Uh, we can only guess. Uh, discrimination certainly has had its part in it. People who have not had jobs for many years, who found that the doors have been closed to them, find other ways of living and just believe that they aren't open now. Secondly, we, we believe that probably our allowances are not sufficient to get males into the program. And third, uh, we just haven't done the job of convincing them that this does offer them something for it. The stability of the Negro family, just as the white family, depends upon the stability of the man. If he is to head his home, he must have a job. If he cannot conform to the social norm, if he cannot meet his financial obligations, if he cannot react out of a sense of being responsible, then he loses respect for himself, his family loses respect for him, and finally, every semblance of family disintegrates as he helplessly looks on. Missouri Welfare Department, in an effort to help stabilize the destitute family, and at the same time keep the man in the home, has instituted what is called a work experience program. It is designed to put dignity back into the unemployed father by either training or retraining him to be a productive member in today's labor force. How'd you find out about the work experience program? Well, I found out about when I ran out of unemployment checks, and I, I knew the hustle wasn't no good, I knew, you know, after a while, I just gave up on it. I went over to the welfare office to ask them for something, you know, because we wanted to try everything. We didn't want to do nothing real sneaky, you know, like 
let her get on ABC. I'll leave leave home, and uh, tell she'll tell the people that I deserted them. That, you know, she has to go through this to get on ABC right. and get child support. We didn't want to do that, you know. <laughs> and she went. Over, we went over there and uh, found out about the work experience over at the welfare office. And what are you doing now in, in the work experience program? What are you learning how to do? Uh, well, I'm going to be a welder. Looking forward to the future? Oh, yeah, yeah. Families together? Mm-hmm. Not selling anymore? No, we get, <laughs> we get along pretty good now. The only, only trouble I have now is the kids, and that's going to be trouble, you know, telling me what to do. <laughs> Business and industry have as yet failed to fully play their role in meeting the problems of the central city. Too often businessmen have brushed aside the needs of the more unfortunate people. They have taken such attitudes as, there's nothing that can be done. If we don't notice it, it will go away by itself. This isn't our problem. It's their fault anyway. Those who think in these terms are wrong. Those people and their problems are there and they will be there. We have in St. Louis block after block of slums where people exist in hopelessness on welfare handout. Poor people make poor customers. Do you want to keep paying taxes to keep these people on the welfare rolls? Or would you rather put them on the payroll and make them customers? Now, I think the principal effort of Work Opportunities Unlimited with employers is to get employers to understand that the people of this group need to be given opportunities to get on the economic ladder so that they can earn a paycheck and in that way be taken off of the relief rolls and thereby lowering taxes, ETC. This is a simple economic lesson. Either private industry will take the initiative in finding economically sound jobs in our tight labor market for these disadvantaged, or it will be the federal government with its inevitable markup, taxes and control. Whether industry or government does the job, it will be industry that will pay the bill. Only the bill will be at least double, and the results at best dubious, if the federal government takes over industry's job. Industry today is inadequately capitalizing upon these vast resources, and failing to do so has set up the stage for what well may become in the expanding series of great American cities, an explosive chain of superwatts. The people who control economics in this country is responsible for the entire problem that exists for the Negro. That's what in the hell are we going to do about right, right, That's what right, we're going to do. Right. Right. You know, we can talk all night, but what are we really going to do? And what about those handkerchief-haired brothers? Are we going to do what we would do if we made a mistake on a piece of paper, erase it? Or are we going to just leave it there knowing that it will be rejected sooner or later? No, I mean, right. we've got to take some concrete action right. or forget it. Right. And don't talk anymore. Once we get started, no cooling off period, no nothing. Just hit and hit and hit until we have completed what we started out to do. Right. We're human beings. And this is what we want. We want to be treated the same as human beings anywhere in the world are treated. As a human being. Have you ever felt like a free human being with dignity? Well, I don't know how they feel. Once the poet Carl Sandburg asked, what is a man worth? What can he do? On the one hand, those who buy labor. On the other hand, those who have nothing to sell but their labor. And when the buyers of labor tell the sellers, nothing doing today, not a chance, then what? What, when as the Words Report points out, Unemployment or sub-employment in the slums of St. Louis is so much worse than it is in the country as a whole. What when almost 50% of these people are unable to earn a decent living?